What's up, everyone? Welcome to the Down Dog Athletics Podcast, a competitor's guide to mental health and mastery. My name is Paul Klingen, and I am your host. And we are coming up on the end of 2019. Can't believe it's going to be 2020 coming up soon in literally just a month and a half. And my Christmas came a little bit earlier. I don't know if any of you guys have ever spent time researching a product for four, five days, maybe even a couple weeks, maybe even longer than that, maybe months, and you're just watching YouTube videos, Amazon reviews. Well, I just went through that for the last week for a camera, lens, and a bunch of other uh, equipment that's going to help me record a bunch of video. And it came today, and I felt like a 12-year-old version of myself unwrapping that Nintendo 64 on Christmas Day. I have no idea how to use it, but I know I'm going to figure it out the same way I figured out how to get this podcast set up and running. And it's just one of those things where you just got to, like, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm scared. But that that fear and that wall of, like, oh, it's got to be perfect, it'll become perfect because it is. The first videos that I create will be horrendous, but you have to go through that in order to get to the good stuff. So I'm just trying to take that mindset, have that mental mastery, uh, and really just attack that fear, be super excited, even though I have no idea, like I said, how it's going to work. But I know that I will eventually figure it out in a year from now. I'll have another podcast that I release where I get some sort of other crazy equipment, and I'm learning it as I go. But I'm super excited because I'm going to be able to release uh, more videos, shoot more photos that are higher quality, and maybe even record some of these podcasts in video form and so I can be uploading stuff to YouTube, more content on the website, more content on social media, get into LinkedIn, get onto Facebook, get onto all of them, and maybe even TikTok. Who knows? Who knows? But I'm just one man, so maybe just just stick with what I got right now. Uh, But anyway, I want to get into today's guest, Sean McCormick. Uh, He is a life and performance coach, works with uh, the MLS, and is a host of the Optimal Performance Podcast, which is a biohacking podcast. And he gets into some crazy stories, some crazy uh, you know, science in this podcast, but he goes even more in-depth in his podcast, has on some real experts in so many different spaces to help you biohack and really upgrade your life. Uh, we talk about a ton of different things today. We talk about transcendental meditation and his experience that is literally out of this world. It is like a Stephen King novel the things that he goes over uh, in this particular uh, episode. We talk about flow state. This is the longest podcast I've ever done. And man, when you get in the zone, time just accelerates so much faster. Uh, And it's a really cool testament to just being able to de-stress, get rid of any of those distracting thoughts, any anxiety about the future or the past, and just be in that present moment. And that's what flow state is. He's the founder of Float Seattle. So he's got a really cool story as well. Uh, tied to meditation and, you know, all the different benefits of floating. Uh, And we talk about a few other things. We talk about microdosing, nootropics, CBD, his daily routine. And I'm just really excited for you guys to give this one a listen. It's a long episode, like I mentioned, so I'm going to get right to it. Here's my episode with Sean McCormick that we did at Lululemon. All right, what up, Sean? What up? Dude, so we're in the University Village Lululemon kind of utility room and it's a cool space and I was like Sean let's record a podcast he's like let's do it at Lululemon and like you know have it be kind of a cool environment so we got this nice mural painted wall we got a nice table much different than you know when you're typically doing like a zoom call or something like that yeah yeah where you have to go through it's a different set of uh issues you know sound and light and stuff rather than the the consistency of an online uh podcast recording this is great this is great well i mean the store is super cool and the people here are awesome yeah and when i walked in he's like hey he's in the back waiting for you (laughs) oh sweet yeah because of course we would record a podcast in in a multi-purpose like a yoga studio yeah how many people have done a podcast in a yoga studio tim ferris do it in a yoga studio, I dare you. Um, <laughs> you'll probably do it in like five and two minutes. Anyway, yeah. um, dude, what's the latest? So we were just talking. You were working with the MLS. Talk a little bit about that. I think yeah. that's super interesting. Yeah, so this has just come up um, recently in the last couple of weeks. I reached back out to the MLS Players Union. So the work that I've done in in the professional sporting world has been about professional development outside of their sport. So, for example... Two years ago, at the annual meeting for Major League Soccer's Players Association, I did a one-hour workshop that was centered around life after sports. Okay. Like, 
have you thought about what you're going to do after you retire? None of them have. Yeah. None of them do. And how could they? You know, they're focused on the training. They're focused on the game. Can we make the playoffs? Uh, active recovery. Like, their, their world is, is, is fairly narrow. So I did a fairly emotional visualization and mindset workshop down in Las Vegas at the Bellagio with the MLSPA two years ago that had a couple of guys crying at yeah. the end of it because they don't think about their futures. So that was really impactful. I stayed in touch with a handful of, of guys from that meeting, some of which are still playing, um, a couple of which are still clients of mine that I've helped them transition out of sport and into their lives, yeah. into their professional lives. So I've just reached back out to them, and we've, uh, we've been collaborating back and forth on how we can take that to the next level because they're planning for next year. So that might be me going and giving some um, life coaching, life skills, stress management stuff at the Rookie Symposium. Mm -hmm. um, it might look like um, another workshop or two at the MLS Players Union, which is attended by one rep from every, of, uh, every single one of the MLS teams where they talk about, you know, uh, contracts and, you know, um, you know, basically the rights of, of the workers of the MLS players, yeah. uh, do work doing workshops there. And then, and then I, I, I like to travel. I don't do it a ton cause I got two small kids, but I like to travel and I have proposed going out to those markets yeah. of, of each of the teams and doing a one hour workshop, which is with each of the teams to like reinforce the message that they should be thinking about what they want to do after soccer while they're still playing. Because the moment you retire, you're totally irrelevant. hundred <laughs> percent. Right. And I think what's interesting about soccer too, is the ones who are really good, they don't go to college. You think like NFL, NBA a little bit, some are one and done, but if you're an excellent footballer, to use the, the international term, yeah. 16, you're on the Chelsea 16U team. You're not going to high school. Right. And it's funny when people make fun of soccer players because, like, the guy can't even read. Well, it's like, if I didn't go to high school, I probably wouldn't be able to read either because they're more focused on being able to dribble through seven guys, hit free kicks, knock in head. And so I think that's super interesting where, like, how are they supposed to even have a plan when literally their entire identity, their entire lives has been wrapped around their ability to control a soccer ball keep it away from other people, maybe save a soccer ball. So is there a little bit of work that has to go into there as well to kind of unravel like, hey, dude, outside of what you do on the pitch, you're still a worthy human being? Yeah, because for, for especially for the international players that are coming from all around the world to play in the MLS, that is exactly the case. They've been playing since they were six. They probably got signed to a club when they were 11 or 12, and they've – they've lived at the facility they've gotten their their um, education at the facility and they've stayed there there's you know um uh, bradayton down in florida which is like tennis and soccer mm -hmm. really specific is an example of that where it's um it's basically like a boarding school and for the clubs for the for the international players that have played at clubs all around the world that come here they don't know how to send a professional sounding email. Yeah. They don't know even how to engage. I don't say they don't know because some of them might, but they, that, that level of professionality and engagement that you and I just sort of take for granted. Yeah. They, they don't have, they don't know the conventions of networking. People come to them yeah. for, for autographs and attention. Yeah. And, and at, at some point you should cash in on that social capital You've, you've, you've put your time in, you're, you're well-known across the world or, or in the States even, and, uh, and that sh you should make that work for you as yeah. early as possible. Yeah. yeah. And so is this, when you're working with them on, you know, how to exist in society after, are you literally teaching them how to write a business email or is it more like, all right, here's a business plan. You want to open up a, a cupcake shop. Here's how we would do that. Is it kind of that full spectrum? It's it's most specifically about leveraging your network. Okay. Uh, it's most narrowly focused on, okay, what sort of things are you interested in? Mm -hmm. What do you want to do? What do you like? Is it apparel? Is it uh, nutrition? Gaming? Do you like, are you turned on by real estate? What are the things that you're into? Okay. Um, of the board members, let's just use the Seattle Sounders, right? Yeah. So within the Sounders new ownership group, there's Microsoft employees, 
there's obviously Adrian Hanauer, who's been there since the beginning. Drew Carey, who's in Hollywood. Uh, Adrian Hanauer is, you know, um, a multi generational family of entrepreneurs based in based in Seattle. But then you also have Russell Wilson, who has five, six, eight, ten, twelve other companies that he runs, including a production company. Yeah. Um, Macklemore. So within, if you're a Sounders player, there is ample opportunity to network with these people at Microsoft, you know, there, and I forget their names. Uh, um, there's there, I think there's three or four of the new 11 families that are part of the ownership for the Seattle Sounders are, um, have been a part of and or board members on Microsoft. Don't you think that a constructive conversation with them about what you're interested in, how do you want to leverage your money? How do you want to be involved? Can you job shadow? exploring, which is really the deeper work that I do is like exploring the self, know thyself. Yeah. How can you know what's most important to you? What do you want to do in your life? If it's, you know, if you're Brad Evans and you retire from a long, illustrious international and domestic career, you know, playing for the crew and, and ultimately retiring from the Sounders, Brad Evans is now cruising around the country in, uh, in a fifth wheel camper just like seeing the world because he hasn't had an opportunity to do that yeah ever. he's only seen stadiums and pitches and Ex yeah exactly yeah, right totally. so now if that's what you want to do cool well while you're doing that and and brad and i have, have stayed in contact a little bit like i keep hassling him to start a podcast and he's like it's just a lot of work and i was like it's not that much work yeah. but what now he's doing is like affiliate marketing and stuff like that to 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 supplement his income while he's on the road so it's like leveraging what you're passionate about and who you know for your own self-interest so that you can make a difference in your community and create like create businesses and organizations that are aligned with your values. Yeah. Who do you think are athletes now that are outside of their sport that have done a really good job of that? I mean, LeBron James is the first one that comes to mind. I mean, the guy is building schools in yeah. Akron, you know, um, him and um, Maverick Carter is his BFF and Confidant, you know, they're launching Uninterrupted, which is, I mean, I don't know if you follow Uninterrupted at all. Um, it's like they have a barbershop show. They have um, a business show. They yeah. have all of these different elements of media uh, surrounding the LeBron brand because you should. Mm -hmm. You should be leveraging as much as you can to create as much um, economic power to keep it for yourself, not for the owner's not for uh, not for anyone but yourself, because the empowerment, especially um, especially with with um, African American athletes, to like keep their money, grow their money, and to to create um, a bigger, more wider reaching brand. So, you know, some other guys that that I think are are doing it well. You know, um, again, keeping it local. You know, Stefan Fry, uh, the goalkeeper for the Seattle Sounders, mm -hmm. is Belgian born, uh, lives in Seattle. He's an artist. And he just launched his um, um, his own personal website designed to feature his art. Oh, cool! It's awesome. Yeah, it's really killer. And and just that alone, the fact that like, hey, people know who I am. They know me as this guy, but I also have interest in the arts. Um, why wouldn't someone want to make, buy one of my paintings for two thousand dollars? And they do. Yeah. And they're killer. Yeah. So it's, it's, a, it's a process, and, and, and all of this is to say it's part of, of being a, just a more well-rounded human being. Yeah. The same thing that you and I are trying to do every day. Yeah, and it's being dynamic. I think another person who's done a really good job of it is Alex Rodriguez. Yeah. And a lot of people go into broadcasting. A lot of people can give their opinion about the sport they played, but he's going into an even broader space. Obviously, he connected with J-Lo. Not every athlete's going to be like, yo, J-Lo, like, we <laughs> should make this a thing. Uh, but I think that's cool, and I think it's really important work that you're doing because it's definitely a bridge that needs to be crossed. And the I the identity of an athlete after whether it's a gold medal, a championship, or retirement, that's got to be one of the hardest things to transition. So yeah. kudos to you for helping them bridge that gap. I'm curious in kind of what your background is, and and maybe why you're gravitated towards soccer, and what kind of got you into this essentially like life coaching, performance coaching space. Yeah. So I grew up, uh, it's funny, now I'm coaching my six-year-old in soccer, and that's where I started. I was a three-sport athlete every year. You're probably similar. Like, yeah. I played basketball and baseball and soccer f every year, mm -hmm. every season, from first grade, uh, from first grade on. Uh, I also did wrestling as a kid, 
uh, and I had to make a choice to, to focus more on soccer. I had to like let one of those go. Oh, sorry, it was baseball, Paul. Yeah, <laughs> it's all good, man. <laughs> I had to say goodbye to baseball in fifth grade so that I could focus on soccer because I, um, I made a select team. And then I was a part of the Olympic Development Program, which is basically like pre-Olympics scouting f- across the country. Yeah. So I played for the Washington State team at 15. And um, it's always been a part of my life. Team sports have so much to give. I mean, so much life skills and learning and leadership. And that's really what kind of honed my personality in a major way. Yeah. Leadership, accountability, like work ethic. Um, so I continued to play. I played, I played football, basketball, and soccer in high school. Uh, I played football for, t- for two years, basketball for two years, uh, I never made the, the, the bridge to varsity in basketball or, uh, or, um, or football, uh, but I played soccer and I was playing on a traveling team. And then I played in college at Western Washington. I was a scholarship athlete for a, D, for a D2 school. And then I played semi-pro right after college, uh, which is not as cool as it sounds, uh, for a year or so, year and a half after, yeah. after soccer, after college was done. Um, so my connection to the sport of soccer, which is the most popular sport in the world, um, has always been there. Yeah. And athletes are fun people. They're, they're, they're active and positive and they've got a can do attitude. Yeah. And those are the people that I'm drawn to. I mean, why, that's why we're sitting here. Yeah. No, good point. <laughs> right. So, uh, that's always been a part of my identity and, and into my, you know, post-college, you know, I got a desk job and then uh, got out of the corporate world to open uh, Float Seattle, which is um, the West Coast's most highest rated uh, flotation therapy centers. So I, fl- I founded, founded Float Seattle in 2012, which was really focused about around self-care, meditation, recovery, um, consciousness exploration, um, and, and an actually a powerful treatment for people with, with a range of, il- of ailments. And then from there, I thought, well, how else can I, what else is my thing? Mm-hmm. How else can I take this further? What do I want to do? And I'm always the person that people call when they have a thing they're going through. And I invite it. You know, I'm happy to help. I've, I've had a lot of, I'm grateful because I've had such a charmed life. Like I met my, I met my life partner at 15. She's my one and only. We've been together for 20 years so like I ha- I wasn't chasing tail in college. Yeah. It wasn't a distraction for me. Like I I, ha- I was I was solid, and so um, I, it's given me the opportunity to go explore all these other things. And life coaching and performance coaching is just it's so interesting, uh, and that sort of found its way uh, into uh, the the podcast that I host, which is the Optimal Performance Podcast, which is one of the longest running biohacking podcasts in the world. Uh, I took that over from. Uh, the the previous host at episode 153 and now we're at 228 um so life coaching performance coaching personal development podcasting floating meditating it's all the good stuff that i like yeah (laughs) you just went you just gave me the back of a really good book so i'm going to dig into those (laughs) chapters a little bit more yeah what was the uh the desk job that you were doing i sold advertising for a local radio station a conglomerate so i the when i was there intercom had 107.7 the end which was a station i listened to as a kid oh yeah kisw the rock uh the mountain before it switched to the wolf and um Oh gosh. Now it's something else. It's like adult contemporary now. Yeah. So I worked, I worked in radio for seven years and then I worked at ESPN radio for a year, which was fun. It was, it's a fun job. Yeah. It was cool. Absolutely. I got to see a bunch of shows, you know, it's, it's, it's media sales. So it's kind of show busy and fun and sexy. You're you taking know? people out. I, Cause I was exactly. on the other side of it as a media planner where you're exactly. like, oh yeah, let's meet with Sean. He always takes us to like the best time ever. The, yeah. the, my, the reps I did business with were the ones that would take us to Blazers games. We'd sit in yeah. the suite in the playoffs, and it's like you're fifty fifty. You're like, all right, these two things are equal. Oh, that dinner was really good. Yeah, <laughs> that concert was kind of sick. All right, cool. Here's five hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean. Right, and that's how it works. And and you work. You're drawn to people that you like working with. Yeah. And when you're a motivated, focused, energetic guy like you are like i am like sales just comes naturally yeah media buying planning you know that sort of thing well, it's, it's connecting with people yeah. it's trust it's i think 
sales is starting to get a better name, but at the end of the day, like it's that connection that you can make with someone rather than like yeah. that one liner, like that, that sleazy car salesman thing. So, uh, did you, to what you were talking about earlier about making connections, did those connections that you had in radio translate into float Seattle? No, no, not at all. It, it was, it was sort of the antithesis of it. Yeah. What uh, was the, what was the state of floating pre 2012? Were there other markets that were doing it? How did you research it? Yeah. I, the, the origin story was I floated at a dude's house in, uh, that I found on Craigslist in 2006. I would do anything <laughs> to read that, that ad. <laughs> Come lay in my bathtub. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's not far from there. <laughs> we'll totally. Pour some, we'll to- pour some Epsom salt on you, and uh, I promise I'll close my eyes. Yeah, totally not creepy. Please come naked, float in my tank. Yeah. Uh, I did that because it was it was part of my deep dive into self discovery that led me to mindfulness meditation. You know, I've meditated since my folks taught me TM when I was twelve, mm-hmm. and my meditation practice kept evolving, and I kept coming across sensory deprivation and uh, flotation therapy I floated and it had I'll spare you the spare you the story but I had a really transcendent experience the first time I floated I had an out-of-body experience let's let's hear the story okay people like stories yeah so I show up at Brian's house in Bellevue and he's a yoga instructor Uh, in fact I mean he's I think he's still around his name's Brian Bales and he was the only person that had a float tank in the city of Seattle there were float centers in Seattle in the 80s, but they closed in the 90s after like the AIDS scare because yeah. people didn't know how diseases were contracted. Yeah. So those all closed down. There was one in Pike Place Market. There was one right next to Canlis. And so th- I was looking all over the place to find a place to float in Seattle because I'm a weirdo. And Brian had one at his house. So I went, I went on my lunch break in my tie and slacks and shirt. And went downstairs, you know, I'm like cautiously walking in and he's like, okay, go ahead and get naked. And I was like, uh, right here. He's like, yeah. well, I mean, you can go, I'm going to see you, but you can go down the hall, just strip down and shower in my kid's basement bathroom and then come down the hall and we'll get you going into this, into the float tank. Wow. So I did. And then, yeah, we, I walked back, I got into the float tank and then there were moments in that first float where it felt like it was 20 minutes and there were moments where it felt like it was four days, but I had an out of body experience in which I left my body and projected. This was the second time that this had happened to me. It happened, um, earlier in that year, uh, involuntarily. Like it wasn't something I was trying to do. It just happened in meditation. I popped out of my body and saw myself there. It'd be wild if we could do that voluntary. You can. <laughs> in fact, I'm building. I'm building a. I'm building an online product that's going to teach people how to do it. Okay, cool. We'll get to that. Uh, I project out of body. I'm relaxed. I'm working on my breath. You know, I have. A, I have enough experience in meditation that I, I. I know what sort of breaths to relax myself. I have enough spe- experiences in meditation to know that. Don't get freaked out. Mm-hmm. Don't get too excited. Yeah. Don't notice what you're noticing. Just let things go. And I did. And then again, popped out of body. And then found myself 10 feet above myself looking down through the float tank and seeing myself and thinking, okay, (sighs) keep breathing. Yeah. And then I turn around and shoot through his house and end up in his backyard where I see in detail his backyard that I had not seen before I got into the float tank. And I saw the path where his dog ran around the perimeter and like wore out this path. I saw a bunch of toys. Um, I mean, I can remember really vividly and then I sort of passed in back in through his son's room and was noticing like the TV and the video games and the posters on the wall with, with total clarity. And then I hear Sean, your time is done. And then I pop back in Yeah. and it changed me. That experience changed my perception of death of life of consciousness of what's possible in physical bodies and um and then i kind of forgot about it for a couple of years it was i think it took me a while to really process that level um the other part of the story that i that i forgot was i had to 
verify that what I saw was what I actually saw. Mm -hmm. So when he's like, okay, I'm going to, I'll go upstairs. We can have a cup of tea and chit chat. Go ahead and get, take a shower and get dressed. And as I went back down the hallway, I went and looked into his son's room and sure as shit, it was exactly what I had seen. Wow. I looked, I went back to this window, looked through the back uh, sliding glass door in the basement, saw the backyard that I had just seen. I forgot about it for a while. And then I had been in the corporate world. I went back to work. I put my tie back on. I remember that I went and saw Sublime that night <laughs> at Marymore Park. Wow. And uh, it was it was the most beautiful music I'd ever heard in my life. I was a big Sublime fan. Anyway, no, I'm sorry. It was 311. Uh, I saw 311 at Marymore Park, and it was super vivid. And, um, and then I forgot about it for a couple of years, and then I went back and went back to work to pay off my student loans. Mm -hmm. And... Um, continued to meditate and deepen my practice. And then I started to look around f about where, where I expected a float center to be open in Seattle, hippie capital of the world, besides maybe Portland. Yeah. And thought, well, there's got to be float centers. And there just weren't. So I, my wheels started to turn. A couple of weeks went by. I started to do some research. And then one day, on a dreary day, on a commute back home with my, um, with my wife in the car, I said why don't we just quit our jobs and open a float center? Mm -hmm. And she goes, what? <laughs> and I said, you remember that thing? She's like, yeah, I remember. I said, there's one in Portland. There's like 30 in the country. There's, there has to be one here in Seattle. Let's just do it. And she was, and she goes, okay. And she never says, okay. Yeah. So at that point, like it, it, that that was a pivotal moment for me in my life because at that moment I knew that my time was limited in the corporate world. I was going to pour my heart and soul and a year's worth of of wages, my salary selling advertising, to to build to build a float center in Seattle. When we opened, there was thirty five, and now there are like six hundred. So in the in the U.S. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, and now Float Seattle has three locations in Green Lake, Bellevue, and now Greenwood. Wow. So then. There's four total in Seattle. There, there are five in Seattle. There's okay. one in South Lake Union, one in Belltown. There are a couple of other ones that just recently closed down for whatever reason. But yeah, there's, yeah, there's five in the city. Have you done any research into what exactly happened? And it, you may never find the answer, but that enables you to see so vividly the backyard of that house yeah. and the boys' room. Because I think back to my experiences. Uh, and the church where similar things would happen. And I kind of look at spirituality and really the unknown that we don't have answers to. We just kind of come up with frames to give us some sense of like security because we're like, okay, here's a frame that explains like 5% of what we really don't know. And so what have you found that really explains what it is that you saw? Cause that is not normal. Yeah. That ability to remote view or, have an out-of-body experience astrally project um is is far goes back as far back as as humanity itself you know usually it was reserved for shaman you know medicine men and women who could transcend their body and see beyond the 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 physical world um there are lots and lots of mystical experiences and and recounts of of, of what that is I have come to learn experientially and also through spending lots of time, again, this is my favorite stuff, spending lots of time reading classic mysticism, um, shamanic work, and there are different parts of us. And our spirit, our psychosoma, is what they, what they sort of scientifically describe it as, is, the, is, our, is our soul. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, our, it's, it's the non-physical version of us it's the non-physical us that can project out of body in states of high vibration in states of relaxation and if you know what to do when you get there you can keep your stuff together you can relax yeah. and stay in that moment with recall i got really into it later and th if anyone is listening to this going, this is fascinating, I want to get into this, go find the book called Demystifying the Out-of-Body Experience by Luis Minero. There's an institute in Portugal that looks a little bit like um, 
you know, Professor X from the X Men has that <laughs> dome yeah, thing. Yeah, the dome. So they have one of those in Portugal where you go out and sleep, and it's got this magnetic uh, liner in it. It's it might even be like projected out over a lake. It's like a platform you walk out to that's supposed to help induce out of body experiences to help you astral project, and the science suggests that you are able to transcend our waking consciousness uh, the dimensions that we are used to yeah you are in an altered state of consciousness you are in communion with everything else that we can't see so in my experiences uh having projections in float tanks and at night which was which is much more common dream you're talking about dreams uh not dreams um like actual projections out of body got it but while you're awake though um, so when you said that, I was thinking like, oh, you know, you go in your dream, you fly around like Mario, and it's great. It's but it's a little different. Different. Okay. So that's lucid dreaming when you have control over your dreams and you can say, well, I want to, I want to have an orgy or I want to fly or whatever. Yeah. You can do that through lucid dreaming. Astral projection has infinite layers beyond that, um, in which you can literally, and I've done this. You can actually see what's happening in the real world, like seeing the backyard at Brian's house, mm-hmm. while you're in a projected state. Yeah. So I've like peeked in people's houses in uh, having an out-of-body experience. I've had experiences of other entities around me in this sort of like soup in a projected state. Mm-hmm. I've communed and connected and collaborated with spirit guides, my own my spirit guides that I that I have connected with in this state of consciousness and um, the the lines of what what we perceive and what we see and what these constructs are what these entities are in that state of consciousness is so blurry and so vast Uh, the way that I describe it is the biodiversity that we have on the planet imagine that like a million times yeah. the stuff we can't see. Yeah. The biodiversity and all the different leaves and animals and minerals that we ha- that we can see and touch and, 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 and log, it's, it's like that within the other dimensions of our consciousness that we can't see. Yeah. So. That's crazy. <laughs> yeah. Is that existing on the same timeline or are you able to fold time and kind of go forward and back into the future and past? So that... That is another category. Okay. The, within, within, you can get into a state of consciousness in which you do look at timelines. I mean, time travel within a projection, I have never experienced, and I don't know if that's part of it. I yeah. think it probably could be. Maybe at some point we have limitations right now. Maybe. <laughs> at some yeah. point you're like, all right, hold your horses, man. Yeah. You're already projecting and seeing a ton of things. Yeah. And, and I had to slow down on it because I was, I was, uh, get it. It was getting away from me. It was getting a little bit overwhelming because yeah. of the intensity of these experiences that I was having night after night at float after float. I kind of backed off it a little bit. Um, but yeah, I mean, as far as time, as far as, as far as travel, that, that's a, that's sort of a druidic teaching. Okay. That's an old like Celtic, a, a practice where you can see timelines forward and back. Um, that was like reserved for like the head shaman in, in the clan on the steps of, you know, old Ireland. Got it. Yeah. Dude, that's cool. So you've got, we've gone from like Ireland. We were talking earlier. Uh, I forget the, the other, uh, you're talking like shaman in, in different parts of the world, but it's yeah. like all these different areas, whether it's, um, you know, India, whether it's Africa, whether it's Northern Ireland, whether it's in the U S Mexico, it's like all these people have had like different experiences with stuff that like we can't explain, but at the same time, it's like people are like, oh, that like that's not real or I don't necessarily believe that. But it's everyone's seen it in different ways. Yeah. And you just got to kind of like kind of surrender to like realizing like you don't know everything. Yeah. I think is the best way I can put it. Yeah. So that's super cool. It's OK to not know. Yeah. You mentioned um, TM. So transcendental yeah. meditation and that you started that at a young age. Can you explain that just a little bit for the listeners and how that might be different from at meditations they might see on YouTube or things that you might see in a yoga setting or, or anything else between that? Yeah. You know, it's funny that you said meditations on YouTube because they're not really meditations. They're, they're, 
they're visualizations. Mm -hmm. So even if you're following someone's voice and they're instructing you to slow your breath or envision droplets of water washing over the top of your crown chakra, top of your head and down your body, those are, those are, those are not really meditations because meditation is a, is a, is an internal experience. Mm -hmm. it, I'm not to diminish those. Uh, I think they're effective for a lot of people, but meditation is to develop your own personal practice. And there's lots of different ways you can do that for transcendental meditation. It's a mantra based meditation. And in TM, it involves, um, the, the repetition of the mantra and the placement of your eyes behind your eyelids slightly up and the recitation of this mantra as, si as, as simply put as possible. That's kind of it. Yeah. You know, like there are coaching and trainings in which you, you go deeper into thinking about consciousness and tools to bring yourself back to your mantra. The thing with TM is that, you know, in order to be s taught to like, go through the whole course, there's a monetary investment that's required. And yeah. I don't even remember what it is now. I think it's over a thousand bucks. I went and did that for a little while in my, uh, in my later years after I learned it when I was 12, my dad just gave me a mantra. He made one up and just said, Hey, Rick, here's what you're going to say. Yeah. When you go there and you practice and learn the technique more deeply, they give you a mantra and you can spend a lot of time researching on how this, how you get your mantra, but there are basic mantras like shutting, shut him. Um, those are, those are kind of the most S H I R I N G shering or shirim. Um, there's like sharang. Um, mine was wa yeah. w, w A. And, and so that, that mantra going back to that mantra every single time allowing my thoughts to to occur to me and then to pass me by um i sort of th thought thought of it as um as thoughts come in they sort of come in through my left ear and then they just go out through my right ear it's the i don't know why i did that i think maybe my maybe my dad suggested that to me when i was 12 and uh, as a as a way to think about the sort of the passage of consciousness mm -hmm. to not cling to it yeah um, but for me, that's how I thought of my mental chatter, which we all have. Yeah. And some of ours are stronger than others and more dominant. But TM, for me, for whatever reason, I found myself feeling sort of depleted by the exercise. My, my, my meditation practice was, you know, you're supposed to do 20 minutes in the morning and 20 minutes at night. Mm -hmm. And I was pretty diligent about that for, a, for years when I didn't really want to, but my folks were like, you need to get out of my face. You need yeah. to either go outside and run or meditate. And so I would, I would go meditate. Um, cause I was just a busy kid. At least they didn't give you an iPad. They, exactly. <laughs> oh God. I mean, yeah. Or uh, Ritalin. Yeah. You know? Yeah. You better point. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's, th yeah, that, to that point, like having these, having these tools, even as an adult, you know, if you're bored, instead of jumping on a Twitter, yeah. just like focusing on your breath um, can be a game changer. Yeah. It makes you a more interesting person, in my opinion. Right. So, so TM kind of switched into, um, m grew into more like a mindfulness meditation practice and then grew deep, more deeply into a sort of a spiritual practice in which I, I was observing um, my place in the world. I was observing my connection with other non-physical entities. I've done a ton of work with spirit guides. I've helped people connect with theirs. I have a relationship with mine. And it's through the different phases of my life starting from 12 to now 36, I have gone through different iterations of my meditation practice and, and now I'm learning something new. I'm learning another one called uh, flow meditation from a guy named James Brown. Um, it's also called Vedic path meditation. Mm. It's mantra based and it's really simple. It can be done in a loud room. It can be done in the middle of the day. It, it doesn't have like strict confines and I found it to be really accessible. Yeah. I just, I, I, I don't know everything. I, yeah. I don't know much. And so learning another meditation practice that might be even better for my life now 
that's a little bit more hectic and busy is uh, always a good thing. Yeah, well, and it diversifies what you can share with others as well if you're yeah. working with players or anything like that. Um, when you were talking about the shift from mindfulness to spiritual, you mentioned uh, the use of mantras, and I f- what I found was interesting is like Shireen, Wa, those don't have any like language, we have an idea of what sad is. And so we're like, okay, sad. Right. But wa, shireen, like, I have no I, I concept of that. So is that what helps you focus? Is that how a mantra kind of helps you use that? Exactly. Okay. Yeah. It's a meaningless word that doesn't mean anything. It's just a sound. And, and the connection to just that sound, the point is not to be like focusing really precisely on, on the mantra yeah it's just a it's a safety net yeah for you to go it's a it's a it's a vantage point it's a it's a signpost to go to when you're thinking about tacos and dog food and your anniversary yeah go back to shering 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 the meat it, it, it's supposed to have zero meaning so that it's it's just a sound that you say to reorient your focus okay yeah Cool. No, I like that. How I, I try and think of, of my thoughts as if I'm standing on a beach and like the waves come in and the waves come out. And as those waves come in and out, they bring different thoughts, which I call boxes. And if I want to kind of study that thought, I look at the box, spin it like this, like this cube. And I'm like, wow, kind of like objectively. And then you set it back down and let it wash out. So when you were talking about how it goes cool. in the ear and out the ear, I was like, whatever works, like people listening, find something that works for you that helps you visualize it so that you're not so attached to those thoughts yeah. and so that you don't stress yourself out and realize that like, Oh no, thoughts are coming in. That's like me worrying that the tide's coming in. Like there's nothing you can do about yeah. it. It's coming for you. Yeah. I and like that a lot. Yeah. So do you, does the box, you said, you know, you kind of moved your hands apart. Does the box like, does it have colors? Is it cardboard? Does it, is it a, is it big? Does it shrink and expand? Yeah. I think it, it can be, I kind of look at it. If you've ever watched um, like the Thor movies, like the Tesseract, yeah. it's this like, colored orb that changes depending on like the emotion so it could be like a really good experience could be a really um, painful emotion and I'm just like like I can put myself in it and experience that but then if you put yourself out of it and kind of like move it away from you and kind of see it what it is and for me it kind of gives me that mind frame of looking at it from different perspectives so if I'm in it I'm just experiencing it as it happened to me but I like to say there's seven billion realities however many people there are there's that many realities and so it's like okay well if i look at the cube from this angle oh okay maybe like i was the asshole hmm. all right cool um i'm gonna set that back down and and let it come out because something else is coming right after that so do you drop it there at the beach do you throw it back into the water or I just, just let sort it, of i just kind of like set it back down in the water because uh, the waves are going to grab it and then pull it back out wow that that level of intricacy that you developed is 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 an esoteric practice the the concept of seeing things upside down and inside out is like um ancient mysticism you know da vinci paintings where you put a mirror up to it and it changes the way that it's seen Mm. like seeing things upside down looking changing the angle man that's cool that's really cool and that's something i got from my yoga practice where I've, i've heard and read where it's like all right you're upside down this is a different perspective and just kind of thinking of like every time you're in a different position, like you're literally seeing the world from a different way. Yeah. And so like, I kind of took that and different pieces from other coaches or meditations I've done. I was like, all right, like I really gravitate towards this visual concept and it helps me articulate what it is that I'm doing with people. Yeah. Uh, but it gives me something to focus on as well. Kinda, I like that. Kind of what lot. you're talking about. So cool. Esoteric and mysticism. <laughs> <laughs> you <laughs> didn't even know it. Exactly. Um, <laughs> uh, Dude, so you got a really cool podcast that does a lot of stuff on biohacking yeah. um, and kind of different ways to engineer and crazy increase the performance of humans. And uh, I want to get into that a little bit. And we were t- there's so many things that I think we could go into there. I think what I would want to start with first is kind of what your daily routine is, because I think in that we'll kind of unpack different times to introduce different things that you do to biohack your day, biohack your week, biohack your life. Yeah. Yeah, great question. It up until very, it's been the hardest thing. Consistency and schedule has continues to be the hard thing, because 
as much as I try to strategize my weeks starting on Sunday night and set my intentions in my meetings, things change. Yeah. Um, in any given week, I will have five or six coaching sessions in which those are either done via Skype, phone, or in person. Um, I may record one or two podcasts with someone from who knows where in the world. Yeah. Their availability. I mean, I have Calendly, so people can book me on times that I have that I have Time structured blocked for that. Yeah, totally. But there's a lot of fluctuation, and and because just the same way that you are, you know, your there's so much variability. Mm-hmm. So consistency is really tough. I'm I'm four weeks into. Um, I, I'm not sh- sure if you're familiar with the with the work of Stephen Kotler and Jamie Wheel. They wrote Stealing Fire. Um, about flow states. Okay, cool. Super um, interesting stuff. Yeah, so right now um, I'm going through the, it's called Zero to Dangerous, and it's basically flow hacking. So wow. what that is is a way to structure my day and my time to be really effective in really short chunks. So up until, honestly, like last Wednesday, it was summertime. Again, I have two small kids and, and time with my family, like actually being present, not on my phone, not with screens, like actually like wrestling with my kids and building shit and having fun and cooking and getting messy is really important to me. Yeah. So because I place such a premium on that time, um, it, it, it does pinch other stuff. So now they're back to school. My daughter's in preschool. My son's in first grade. They go to the same school. So now I have from 8.30 until 12.30, Monday through Thursday, where I can do my work. Yeah. So within this um, Zero to Dangerous training, we're talking about Carl Jung. We're talking about uh, Friedrich Nietzsche. We're talking about flow triggers. And, and uh, extreme sport athletes are like the, the flow hackers of flow hacking. Okay. Um, you know, spinning... Um, novelty, um, having a challenge, high stakes. These are all things that trigger flow states. You know, you've, you've been in flow states a lot, yeah. whether it's instructing yoga, whether it was an at bat that you don't even remember being at bat. Yeah, totally. You know, when I think what's interesting when you mention um, like extreme sports athletes, you almost have to be in that flow state because if you're not the concept of a double backflip 200 feet in the air is like, not something you want to be in any other state right outside of a flow state right you can't focus too hard on it yeah it's better if you just let your muscle memory take over yeah you know the same thing goes for public speaking the same thing goes for the like you and i are likely in a flow state right now yeah high level of novelty you know there's people walking by the studio kind of peeking in so like it's visible Mm -hmm. that people are going to listen to this so we are in a flow state now and what i'm learning through this training is not only to structure my day and my time to be as effective as possible i don't want to work 80 hour weeks ever ever yeah i just don't yeah i want to be I want to be world class at 40 or less. Yeah. And typically it's like 26 work hours per week. And in that 26 hours, I want to crush it. I yeah. want to I want to write quality blogs. I want to create quality quality video content. I want to do a great podcast and be really effective for my clients. And in order for me to do that, I know I'm beginning to learn what my flow triggers are. Yeah. Um, exercise is a huge part of it. Meditation is a huge part of it. Um, t- totally honest, like a little bit of cannabis uh, mm-hmm. is can be a huge part of it. Um, quiet in the in the room that I'm in is really important to me. I'm finding, and um, and turning my phone off because I'm I oh, I, man. I do like shiny objects and Instagram is a beast. So <laughs> the phone is like an alligator, it's and if terrible. flow state is a fish, like it's just going around <laughs> just gnawing on you. Yeah. You have yeah, no chance against the phone. It's it, it's for I have to. It's again. Um, I I really have to be accessible. My wife just went back to work, and I'm home. So like, if something happens at school, I've got to be able to be reached. Yeah. Like, I I can I I can I can account for that sometimes, but I kind of need to be accessed. Yeah. So I have to like turn my phone off for little short periods of time to like spend 25 minutes on this one blog post to get it done. And then I stand up, I do some push-ups, 
uh, I spin around a few times to kind of reorient my 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 um, my equilibrium. Yeah. And then I go back to my desk and I hammer again. You know, a little bit of caffeine, some nootropics, maybe some microdosing of some psilocybin, and that is all. These are all catalysts to get me into a flow state where I can be my best and highest performing every single time. And th- honestly, the this course has been really fascinating and and you know the the greek stoics are also we're also sort of flow hackers like shit happens Mm -hmm. what are you going to do to deal with it how are you going to how are you going to transcend the situation that you're in how are you going to be able to keep your stuff together to focus to get this thing done expect turmoil yeah expect to be uncomfortable what will you do in those moments and if you're too focused you're out of it if you're not focused at all, you're out of it. You got to be just right. You got to lean into it. So I'll 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 keep you keep you looped in. But um, at the end of this, I'm gonna have a really clear. I mean, just in four weeks, I'm my productivity is 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 probably four axed. So this is a course based off the book Zero to Dangerous. The the book the the author is Stephen Kotler, and the the training is. Uh, it, it t- those books talk about flow and flow states. Got it. Using a lot of examples of people who have who have been really good at being in flow states, and there's also a, a, a scientific explanation um, what's happening in our neurochemistry that we're into flow states. You know, there's a fair amount of epinephrine. There's a fair amount of dopamine, <clears throat> and that that neurochemical cocktail at just the right moment at just the right time. Yeah. Lit a candle. And did some push-ups, little little like puff off the vas- vaporizer, and I'm in a flow state, and I can get into it and 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 do great work. So that that experience that I'm going through is going to aid me in my coaching to people. Yeah. And it's also going to help me be my best for the world. So, for I'll give two different examples: an athlete just misses a penalty kick, they are out of flow state. Oh yeah. Everything's hitting the fan. They can't just take a puff of the vape. They right. can't do push ups, spin in the chair, like have a shot of ca- caffeine. So what can an athlete on the field do? Yeah. And then I'll ask the same question for someone who's like just shits their bed giving a presentation, then they gotta turn around and do another presentation. For those folks, breath is everything. Yeah. Breath is everything. You know, is it a box breath? Like you miss a penalty, there are millions and millions of people looking at you. If that's you messed up. Yeah. How do you get back down to baseline. How do you purge those negative thoughts? And there's mental ways to do that. There's mental training, yeah. you know, to to actually replay it and watch it go in just to like diminish the 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 psychological like effect of having screwed up. Yeah. There's ways to use neurolinguistic programming or the use of anchors yeah. to like, you know, turn up your confidence or turn down your fear. You know, you and I have talked about that before. Yeah, kind of drawing on resources of times when maybe you made that that penalty kick or you scored a bicycle, scored a free kick, scored like a game-winning goal, and you're like, all right, I, I was really confident that time. Let's bring the mind back and draw on that resource. Yeah, and that takes practice, right? You right. can't just make it up right there in the, in the middle of the game. Like, you have to – that stuff takes fine-tuning and practicing. But breath, for me, is always the, the, the biggest one, and I'm always looking at and experimenting with – breathing techniques the box breath is really effective um the four seven eight breath is really effective like sticking your tongue out and just ah, just like letting purging yeah. you know that that helps too so like an athlete like tom brady or athletes that are very good at throwing an interception hit having a home run hit off them and then the next pitch the next play they're there is that stuff that I don't want to say they're like born with, but so many people want to just be like, oh, I can't do that. They're born with that. And I think that's a lot of people's way of like ig- like shying away from the work because it would take work to get to that. And I right. don't want to acknowledge the bottom of the iceberg that goes into like that 2% that you see on TV. Right. But like are some people able to do that better based on how they grow up? Because that is something you can't really control. Yeah. Or is this something that, you know, maybe someone has a really hard home life and they start at level zero, and you can get them up to level 100. Or sometimes, like, you got to at least be level 30 in order to get to level 100. Otherwise, you'll kind of be capped at where you're at. I'm speaking, like, weird analogies, but it made sense. I, I like it. it. I, I, this, this is fascinating. Um, on the last thing you said, 
uh, one of my friends is a EMDR therapist. Uh, she's a psychotherapist. Um, and what EMDR is, well, it, it's, 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 a, it's a technique in which you follow my fingers as I wave them back and forth in front of your face, and then we're going to relive one of your traumas. So we're going to go back to six years old when you were in that car accident and you saw X. Yeah. We're going to go there, and now we're going to kind of wipe it. That, that, that technique um, helps to reprogram and, and diminish the psychological effect of trauma. Yeah. <clears throat> what, um, what she is most interested in, um, uh, her name is Carmen Bichon. She's in Bellevue. And she is making the connection. And, and, and uh, you know, sports psychologist um, Mike Gervais, uh, who works with the Seahawks, also talks about yeah. trauma and performance. If you have experienced some sort of trauma in your life, um, abuse, neglect, um, your father wasn't around, um, you lived in a rough part of town, you build resilience. And, and that, that, that reference point of that traumatic experience as a kid, um, as hard as that is, may actually help you perform at a higher level later in life. Got it. So there's, I think that's fascinating. I don't know much about it, but I, I get it. Yeah. Uh, the other thing, you know, as far as like the Tom Brady example, I think that you get to be, I wish you could have chosen a different, (laughs) (laughs) uh, you get to be that level of performance, not only by having a, a God given ability to be able to, um, shake that off an interception, but that coupled with repetition. Yeah over and over and over for years and years and years and years and years. And And I don't know how, I don't know when Brady started playing quarterback, but probably since he was 13, 14, certainly 15 in high school. Yeah. He's had so many repetitions coupled with this ability to like readjust and to be neutral about what just happened. Yeah. Just to be neutral about it. Like that that happens. Is is that, could that almost be described as like even keel stoicism where being very stoic as an athlete is beneficial because you see people that are like super energetic Ray Lewis, like pregame, right. but then being able to go into whatever arena you're in and being able to just be like, if I score a goal tight, if I miss a penalty, darn it. And obviously you're going to ride a little bit higher, a little bit lower, but is there value in, in that stoicism or do you? Totally. Yeah, totally. In fact, it's been stoic philosophy, philosophy, uh, Ryan Holiday wrote The Obstacle is the Way. Um, stoic researcher, philosopher, fascinating writer, really great writer, which where he talks about um, specifically NFL teams uh, adopting stoicism. Yeah. Th- shit's going to happen. Mm-hmm. Sometimes things fall apart. Um, how you respond versus react to those situations is it's everything. It's everything. How do you respond to getting tackled behind the line? How do you respond to, um, you know, th- throw three touchdowns? Can you rest at that point? No, it's it's this neutral level of I'm going to trust my training. I'm going to trust my body. I'm going to go through my progressions in my reads. I'm going to find that guy and I'm going to throw him the ball. Because you've done it thousands of times just that week. Over and over and over and over. And if you can face adversity with a a balanced and neutral perspective you're you're not going to be so ego crazed when you win and you're also not going to be super depressed when you lose yeah you're going to be able to to like trust your body and your training and do what it is that you were born to do yeah you know yeah i like to think of it as like a tree like the more repetition you've done maybe it's more just focusing on your breath meditation like the deeper those roots grow yeah and so as that hurricane comes like you're not going to get blown over by shit hitting the fan. But as a tornado comes, you're not going to like lose your cool when things go really well because you're just like so rooted down in, in essentially what we're talking about, whether it's your breath, your practice, your repetitions, like that's really where the money's made, not from like one-off things totally. of a really good workout. Totally. Uh, you mentioned, we were talking about trauma a little bit and recently in the news, the um, John Hopkins opened up kind of a psychedelic, facility to kind of research psychedelics so as a biohacker like that's got to be something that you're just psyched about right yeah psych psychedelics sorry <laughs> i'm so funny <laughs> yeah it, it's it's the next frontier yeah it's the next frontier um 
I I attended um, so Maps, which is the the global sort of the most well known, the most powerful, the most influential organization around psychedelic research. Maps stands for the Multidisciplinary Approach for Psychedelic Studies. Rick Doblin is uh, the president. Yep. Um, they do, you know, um, I went to a Zendo training in which you are taught how to be present for someone having a psychedelic experience. How can you sit with them? Wow. What are you supposed to do with someone who's having a psychedelic experience? What happens when things go gnarly? What happens when they run? How do you, how do you support them? Yeah. Which in and of itself is fascinating to hear like what best practices are. Um, but the, in that training, they talked about the future of psychedelic basically centers where you could go for a weekend and do, or three or a week, shit, I don't know, and do three or four um, macro, macro, larger doses of psilocybin. Um, um, can you go in a weekend and process PTSD f as a veteran with MDMA-assisted psychotherapy? Can you go do ayahuasca with a trained shaman for three or four nights in a row to kick opiates? It's coming. Yeah. It's coming. And with the, with the legalization of mushrooms, um, specifically psilocybin in Denver, and is Portland there too? I, they got to be. I I'm think surprised they are. the John Hopkins Research Center isn't in Portland. I think Portland's involved too. I think that they're okay with it as well. Um, th that signals, I think, a couple of things is that the, the old guard uh, of the baby boomers who grew up watching Reefer Madness that then birthed the D.A.R.E. program, which treats heroin the same way as they treat a joint, which I think is terribly harmful. Yeah. And that's coming from a kid who I wrote. I, I was one of the three kids that read their D.A.R.E. essay at the end of D.A.R.E. graduation at the all-school assembly oh, wow. at D.A.R.E. graduation. Well, I think the, even just drugs in general, people are so quick to say that that person's a shitty person. And I think another thing that'll come is just kind of, you know, there's mental health and all that becomes more prevalent and more studied and people aren't as ignorant about it. It's like people aren't shitty people and doing drugs. They're using it to cope for something that was traumatic. Yeah. Yeah. M most, I would say most of the time it's, 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 it's a coping mechanism. It's, um, it's a mental illness that they're trying to figure out and this helps a little bit. Um, and if you start using scary drugs early, it, it really prohibits your prefrontal cortex to develop. Yeah. So whenever you start using heroin, that's how well, that you're going to be that you're going to mentally be that old for the rest of your life. Yeah. So if it's 15 or 16 and your prefrontal cortex Hasn't isn't developed. developed until you're 25, you're now 40 and you still think like a 15 year old. So your level of organization is really bad and your, you know, your prospects for, for personal development and growth and just staying alive is, it becomes really challenging. And if there were a place where you could go to not only explore your consciousness in a way to help process a little bit, I mean, I don't know if you've ever done MDMA, but the experience of infinite love. Yeah washing over you. I love everybody. Exactly. I want to be loved. This like outpouring of this, uh, this heart chakra opening experience where you get to, you get to see what that love feels like that there's this m immense amount of, of affection and appreciation and peace and love in, in the world that you can be accessed in. Like you take, you take a pill and 45 minutes later, suddenly you're, you're a part of your brain that has never been tapped into is now readily available for you and you have a therapist sitting right there that's saying like hey let's talk yeah what's, what's been going on for you yeah you see it and, and you translate it in, a, in a new way so yeah john hopkins and 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 specifically with the psilocybin um it's it's going to it's going to revolutionize the future of the way that we look at at um at treating our brains and our and our 
our psychology, I think. Yeah. And I think the other thing that's cool too is as that becomes more popular, they will there'll be systems for people to get trained in it to help more people. There's a billion personal trainers and that's like the front to try and help people physically. But as I've even as a personal trained, I'm like, man, I'm really just trying to like pull off like individual leaves of ivy that's growing when like somewhere deep down there's like rooted stuff that needs this in order to really address the issue why someone's binge eating or address the issue why someone doesn't believe that they are worthy yeah of changing their life and it comes back to six years old father or mom or someone in sixth grade was like you're a piece of shit and you're like man i'm a piece of shit forever um yeah and w- what's cool about what you talked about in being a- be able to access the different parts of the brain uh, is just how through trauma, like those bridge and pathways get broken um, or damaged or it just doesn't work the right way. But you know, we were talking the, the psychotherapy that this is going to allow people to do is essentially like create a whole new highway system for their brain. And between that uh, meditation and, and all the different things that's becoming more and more popular, that's where I'm super excited yeah. for kind of the future. And it's almost like we've talked about this before, but the society is like just now adopting the iPhone, but instead of a hard square, it's like consciousness. It's like a different way of masculinity. It's a different way of, of treating people. Uh, I, uh, we're going to definitely see a lot less um, reliance on pills and drugs and all of that. And hopefully that with that comes like, better access to better food and better health care and money will always kind of dictate the healthcare system, but hopefully we start to get different ways that it's more accessible yeah. and, and just helps us in a, in a better way. I think it will remind us that we can grow still. Yeah. We can change. We can work on ourselves and we should be Th- having access to services and research like bon- John Hopkins. That's a, that's a big deal. Yeah. That in 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 many people's minds says a it makes a very large statement about the power of these tryptamines. You know, this little fungi growing randomly here and randomly there on you know animal scat somehow um, allows your brain to repair itself and get better and become less anxious and less depressed and 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 grow in a more graceful way like oh that's everything yeah that's huge it'd almost be cool as like ai is going to come we're going to continue to advance technologically but it's like how can we advance consciously or psychologically or yeah. different ways that because i always like to think 200 years from now people are going to read in the te- be reading the textbook on us <laughs> right so like we read about you know 1776 sure. and what happened that year some 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 point people were like 2019 remember anyone remember what happened yeah I'm like i do i didn't i don't think about that very often that you're right <laughs> you're right but it's it's cool times and uh i don't know the the whole point of this podcast is we've talked about so many things like different ways to master your mind and really kind of biohack and set yourself up for better personal development but then also on that mental health spectrum i like to think of it as mamba mentality and just being super dialed in and in flow state but then also like how can you help people that maybe need a little bit more help with depression with anxiety suicidal thoughts anything in between there's 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 so there's so much available to us that that we don't know about that are that's natural Mm -hmm. that's um that's affordable that's effective you know red light therapy infrared saunas cbd um, psilocybin microdosing, these these sorts of things. I mean, for me, this is this is my wheelhouse. This is I live in this zone where yeah. where we talk about this sort of stuff. Um, I'm I'm you know deeply interested in it and apply it a lot you know with my clients and in my own life. And it's you have to kind of seek it out yeah. because it's 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 not widely talked about. Yeah, you're not gonna find it at Bartell Drugs. No, you're not. And you're not going to see it on, um, you're not going to, you're not going to read about, um, you know, reprogramming your subconscious mind through gratitude and brain heart integration. You're not going to see that like yeah, on Fox news, on Fox news or time or 
or Seattle Times or, or whatever, you know, you have to come to podcasts like this to open up your coconut a little bit yeah. to be open to new ideas, to new people, to new ways of thinking, because there are, there are a lot of really cool people doing really hard work to help people. Yeah. And, um, and it's accessible. It's available. Yeah. One of the things you mentioned was CBD and I'd love to hear from you the actual benefits differences because it is so prevalent now Yeah, and anyone on social media can go grab a 15% off discount code for CBD products. And yeah. when it, when it's that, I don't, I don't want to say like diluted or like easy to access it, like it loses its validity because it's not necessarily true, but what is, what is kind of like the truth and how can we like, parse out the BS from like the actual benefits. Yeah. So I just recorded right before coming here, I just recorded a podcast with uh, about this very topic specifically. So I work with a company called natural stacks, which makes open source supplements that are batch tested and, um, uh, with traceability. So, you know, where each of the ingredients are coming from, there's no proprietary blends or secret stuff in there. Everything is posted. Everything is tested. And they have, we have two uh, CBD products. One is called um, Omega CBD, which is combined. Um, so a couple of key terms I think are important. So full spectrum means it's the whole plant. Yeah. Um, isolate means it's just the CBD molecule. Full spectrum means that there are aromas, there are terpenes, which are, um, which are healing oils, essential oils, um, colorations, that are important for our body's uh, biodiversity and can help us in, in various ways. So, you know, vaping um, a, uh, uh, a CBD uh, isolate or a, a cannabis isolate is much different experience than taking a CBD um, full spectrum. Uh, there, a lot of the CBD products that we see, the hemp actually comes from China. There's nothing wrong with China, but it's likely not organic. It's yeah. likely grown with artificial light and pesticides and gnarly fertilizer. Even some of the CBD products that you see, they say it's from European hemp, but what's actually happening is it's Chinese hemp that gets processed in with Europe. With European hemp. With European hemp. Yeah. Smashed together and then shipped over for processing in the States. Um, to be synthesized into the final product. So there's a lot of really bad stuff out there where they use methanol, where they'll use butane and these harsh, harsh oil, um, 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 solutions, solvents, to extract the oil. And when you take it or if you vape it, you're actually like vaping gnarly, toxic gases. Yeah. And... And that can ruin your experience too. If you're trying CBD for the first time, you, you vape it or whatever, you get a headache. It's not from the CBD. It's from the stuff they use to process the CBD. Got it. So looking for um, the ingredients, um, the lab tests is important when you're looking at a CBD product. What, what do the lab tests say? Are there polyphenols? Are there other uh, flavonoids and, and elements, which is full spectrum that include all these things? Or is it just just the CBD molecule that doesn't have any of the other, um, um, they call it an um, entourage effect. A whole plant squished down um, is a better product than something that's been stripped out to isolate the molecule, in my opinion. Got it. <coughs> the, the, these, I've tried dozens of different types of tinctures and, and, and uh, pills and stuff. These are my favorite. Um, it's called, so the company is, you go to naturalstacksplus.com. There is an omega CBD, which is made with DHA, which is fish oil and algae. So it's, uh, it's a two strain full spectrum CBD product. It's a pill. It's 10 milligrams, which is not a ton, but it's so high quality that it's really effective. Yeah. Um, and then there's a nighttime, um, CBD product that's again, full spectrum that's combined with lavender oil to promote sleepfulness. Sleepfulness isn't a word. Uh, it's <laughs> it also has a microdose of melatonin to help you stay. So go to sleep and stay asleep. Yeah. And they are 
really like really wildly effective really like your the experience for me and my friends that have taken it it's like you're just better to be around you're in a better mood you're not as tense for the omega cbds and then like 30 minutes before bedtime taking the uh dream cbd you're ready to go to bed yeah so you got to kind of look at like how is it processed and if they can't tell you don't buy that shit yeah can you get lab tests if you can't don't buy that shit. Yeah. The, in, in my opinion, and, and everybody who's listening to this one should listen to um, the Optimal Performance Podcast that we just released. Um, I'm not sure when this episode's going to make it out, but it's with Roy Krebs, and it's all about CBD. Okay, cool. So that's that's the best way to do it. it it's it's massively powerful, especially for active athlete, athletic, you know, folks like... Well, like even Tyson just, even just sleep, like, that's one of the yeah. biggest things that people struggle with, and... If you don't sleep, you're going to have so a lot of problems, whether it's stress, performance. The uh, I was coming up, I like analogies. I was thinking about, uh, you know, at arcades where you got to drive through the checkpoint. Like sleep is those checkpoints. But oh I always yeah. say, people are always like, oh, can I train two times a week? Three t- or sorry, two times a day. Can I do this class, this class, then train with you? And I'm like, if you can make it through that checkpoint day after day, sure, you can work as hard as you can recover from. But what people yeah. don't realize is, professional athlete has so many resources to recover they'll float massage therapy cryotherapy they get 10 hours of sleep they're on the couch chilling after their practice whereas yeah. like if you're at your desk and you're crushing yourself like eventually you're gonna run out of coins the, most most people especially highly active professionally driven people who are asking about whether or not they should train twice a day those folks maybe have not had a restful night's sleep in years. Yeah. They may not be getting into phase two and phase three or REM sleep each night. That's why they wake up tired every single morning. Yeah. And part of that is, it could be a lot of things. could be EMF exposure, turn off your router before you go to bed. It could be that you're looking at a screen until right, um, right against, and everybody does this. Yep. You're looking at a screen until the moment it's time to go to sleep. Well, that blue light that's smashing your eyes, rods and cones, is telling you it's daytime. Yep. So as you're watching TV, um, you should wear blue blocking glasses so that you can allow your brain to get into um, uh, pre-sleep. So th- th- that you're right. I mean, sleep is sleep is everybody's doing it wrong, and yeah. sleeping pills are terrible for you. Yeah. Terrible. Because then you're relying on it. Relying on it. Yeah. You're not. You're, you're. It'll mess up your circadian rhythm and 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 keep you from creating your own melatonin. And up up here for us in in Seattle, like it's going to be dark early soon. Yeah. You know, it's going to sunset's going to be like five or six o'clock here in a little bit, and that's about the time that you should start like turning some of the lights off in your home. Yeah. And at the very minimum, like dimming your phone. But you really should be wearing, you know, blue blocking sunglasses so that you can you can be ready to sleep at ten thirty or eleven thirty if you're an animal. Yeah. You know. But I mean, I would recommend getting to bed sooner because to your point, the circadian rhythm. As soon as it's dark, our bodies are designed to go to bed. As soon right. as that sun's up, our bodies are designed to wake up. So any light in the room, TV, phone, man, I don't know what else would be light, but got to turn it off. Yeah. Yeah, like there's a there's a couple of people that I follow really closely and, and, a, and a few that I've had on the optimal performance podcast that talk specifically about light and practicing now watching every sunset and every sunrise every day, make That's sure cool. you're outside watching the sun come up to establish your circadian rhythm to like um, activate your mitochondria production. You know, we get energy from the sun just like plants do. Yeah, um, it, it helps with ATP production and we need that for energy and this is sort of this new phase of of dealing with light and seeing every sunrise and sunset i have i've been i've been getting into the habit of going outside and standing in the grass barefoot in the morning time drinking my coffee um sometimes i see the sunrise but it's cloudy now so yeah. you know it's you still get the effect, I, though. I, I'm just Im- imagining a Folgers commercial of you walking out <laughs> and a cup of coffee. <laughs> Son, is, are there any things that, because Seattle, like, as you mentioned, gets dark and you get up higher and into Alaska, there's less sun exposure. Are there things that people can use that uh, essentially is like artificial sun? I've seen some friends use them where it's different from your phone or your TV screen, but it's like actually giving you 
the the same benefits as the sun. Yeah. So there's something that's called the light box that you can turn on in the morning time when you're starting your morning routine, which is basically a light that is that is um, the same. I don't know if it's the same wavelength, but it's a it's a bright light that you can put in. Um, to get yourself going in the morning. There's also a biohacking device called the human charger where you put these headphones in your ear and they shine light through your ears into your brain Wow! to help wake you up, to tell you it's daytime. They work like crazy. Human chargers, amazing. Um, you can also, you know, if you're interested in, in red light therapy, the, the science with red light therapy is phenomenal. It's gets rid of cellulite, increases blood flow, speeds recovery, tightens skin, um, reduces swelling, um, uh, reduces all-cause mortality. You can start doing red light therapy in the morning to, uh, to get that same light effect on your skin, which is energizing and replenishing too. But yeah, I think the light box, the human charger, and then it's, some people have uh, Juve is probably the most popular brand. Juve lights are the most popular like red light therapy brands. Cool. Yeah. And if those don't work, a lightsaber probably would work great. If, if you have a lightsaber, <laughs> yeah, just, just set it in a coffee right table. Right your desk. Uh, <laughs> dude, thank you so much for coming on. This is the longest podcast I've done, and it's because, to your point, we were definitely in a flow state. Uh, before we get off, I just want to, one, thank you, but two, where can people find you to, whether it's your podcast, whether it is website, social media, so that they can connect with you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, this has been fun, man. I can't believe that it's, I'm looking at the timer. It's been a freaking hour and 20 minutes. That's killer. Um, you can find the, the podcast. I have two, actually. The one that's, that's, that's most popular is called the Optimal Performance Podcast. It's one episode every single week, and it, it is everything that you need, tools, tricks, strategies from experts to help you live the most optimal life you can. I've touched on a lot of the topics in this conversation that I cover in the podcast with experts. Um, you can find me on my personal website, which is seanmccormick.com, S-E-A-N-M-C-C-O-R-M-I-C-K.com. Uh, and you can find me on Instagram at uh, real Sean McCormick. Cool. Is yeah. there a fake one that you had to I, I always find it funny when people are like, oh, someone stole my name. <laughs> <laughs> there's, yeah, there's uh, the, the Sean McCormick is a NASCAR fan in uh, Nashville. And he's just a, he's just a dude. Yeah. And so. Well, at least it wasn't the website. When you got to, when yeah. someone has your website, well, then you're like, oh my yeah. God. I mean, your name is fairly unique. Yeah. Um, I'm not the first Sean McCormick. So I did have to, I did have to save up and, and, and buy the domain. Oh, funny. From some, somebody that was holding it hostage. Yeah. But yeah, real Sean. The, 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 the other comment I get is like, are you a Trump supporter? And I go, what? And they're like, well, he's real Donald Trump on Twitter. And I go, no. Oh my God. That's no, no, Man. no, no. That's not. Those people are not biohackers. No, no. Awesome. Well, dude, thank you again so much. This is great. Yeah. Thanks for coming on and uh, catch you next time on the Down Dog Athletics Podcast. Thank you.